Okay, now you have to listen to me a little bit more today. So I'm the next presenter, hello, I'm Tom Rondo, yada yada yada, getting radio, blah blah blah. Um, so, for the purpose of the recording, I'm Tom Rondo, I'm a DM the radio project. Uh, and I'm gonna, there's going to be a little bit of rehashing of a lot of what's been said already today uh, in this presentation, but this is called How Not to Write a Blog. Um, it's kind of a, a takeoff on the early days of being radio when before GR Blog School we had this project called GR How to Write a Blog, which is you were supposed to copy that to your own module space, rename everything and kind of walk through it. But it was also a how-to to do this stuff. So I just want to walk through a few situations of you know what goes what what can you do when things go wrong while you're writing a blog. So it's a little bit of a of a, a debugging helper uh, talk. Um, I hope it works. So there's gonna be a lot of stuff here. Um, for those of you who are in radio people already, um, I will be doing stuff that you will obviously want to scream at me about at first. That's on purpose. Uh, so, you know, when, when, that, when that stuff happens, don't, don't immediately jump up and raise your hand. We're gonna, we should cover those, those things. Um, so this is, well, this is just the, uh, the, the uh, project statement here. Just want to work. So we're going to walk through building a blog. And I do it by hand. These are all just slides. You can see there's a lot of slides here, so we're just going to try to tick through these slides as a way uh, to see the different pieces of what I'm talking about. But when we come to these errors, what do we do about it? That's what we want to uh, talk about. Uh, so what's my task? I have to define some tasks. I want to write a new block. It's got to do something. It's just this arbitrary concept that I came up with. All right, so I've got a digital signal at some form of clam, and in that clam, there's going to be a known word, some or some uh, uh, some identifying marker that I want to detect, and then signal downstream that I have detected this thing. Um, so the trigger that we're going to use our QT GUI sync, our constellation sync. And I'm going to trigger, uh, set that up to trigger off a particular tag. So, at it, so what a tag does is it says, hey, at this sample, something happened. Um, and we're going to identify what that happening is. And that's going to tell the, the constellation thing, hey, let's plot the signal. Uh, so that's what it's uh, supposed to do um, as far as the, from the signal perspective. But I also wanted it to do some kind of signal processing. And so I kind of arbitrarily, not so arbitrarily, you'll see us uh, when we're done, uh, it's just going to perform that mathematical operation. Uh, just going to uh, double the imaginary part of the signal. Just so that there's some math in there so that the data stream isn't just, you know, input copy to the output. Uh, so we can see that. Um, so what we're, yeah, we'll see some uh, images of what it looks, of what this detection statistic is going to kind of look like. So first off, I want to start with a, uh, the flow graph that I'm going to plug my block in, my detector block in, uh, um, to see what's going to go on. Uh, Every time I do one of these things, we're going to start small. We're going to start slowly and then add our new thing, right? Because we want to make sure that the rest of the package works before we put in the thing that we're trying to build because chances are we're going to do something wrong in the process. It's good to know that we have something working here. So here's a flow graph that is going to pull in. It's just going to generate some random noise, uh, some random data, modulate that with one type of constellation. Uh, and then there's going to be, so that second half, actually, two that the measurement um, this. Um, so we're getting there's, kind of, there's two paths here through uh, the upper stage of the random source and thank you very much. Uh, up here, the upper stage. So that's just some random data here. Here's some. Here's the known word. That's the thing. So we're going to mux these together. So hundred thousand samples are going to go in uh, from the data stream, and then this known word is going to be mussed in, kind of like a, a, a frame pattern. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to find a frame header in the midst of all this other random, random uh, noise here. Uh, here's a virtual sync. This is just like an arbitrary connection in GRC, if we didn't cover that earlier. Uh, so these are just a nice way of keeping your flow graph clean on your screen. Uh, so this is essentially a connection from there down to there. Channel model, I'm just going to add some noise to the signal so it's not a perfectly pristine signal. Uh, and then I'm going to do a timing recovery. I'm not going to bother with the rest of the receiver, like frequency and phase recovery. Uh, so we're not going to adjust those at all. We just want to do some sample timing recovery just to get a good constellation out uh, for the purpose of, of exploring this concept. All right, so I've, I've run this. I, wanna, I, I expect to see a constellation. And I'll tell you, the known constell this constellation up here is QPSK. So I've defined that here. It's a simple QPSK constellation. I run the signal, nothing happens. That's the first part where you stop and go, well, shoot, I did something wrong. Uh, it's a good thing I didn't waste time on the detector uh, algorithm that I wanted to write because I still, you know, 
I don't know if it would be the detector or my flow graph. So we should be seeing a known constellation. We're seeing just this blood <coughs> noise here. So what's the first thing that we do? Plug in some instrumentation. So plug in, in this case, I'm just going to use a time sync, uh, right after the channel model. So if this is a receiver, we're just going to look at the first thing that the signal receives and the time sync on the output. So now we compare these two uh, stages. Here's our output of the channel model. That looks good. That's kind of noisy, QPSK-ish type stuff. Uh, you can see that all right. Uh, but down here, it's just this dull noise system here. So going back to the flow graph, we can see, okay, if that's good and that's not, well, something is wrong with my block in there. So what do I do for that? I look at my, uh, um, the block and I see, okay, well, how does this block work? And the first thing we need to do, or we should be doing, is going to the manual. And with luck, this block is, uh, is documented or, or uh, will be documented if we detect some, some difficulties and we, uh, we help out the project and, and provide the documentation. Well, we look at the, uh, at the PNG clock sync. So go to the, the manual page. This is the one that's online. Okay, you get the manual, you can build it yourself, you can have it locally. But this is always the current uh, version of the radio. The manual is uh, located at that URL. And then there's a search field, so you can search for PFB uh, clock sync. Now, how did I go to look for PFB clock sync? Uh, it's because. Because down here, in the properties, as you open that up in GRC, notice that we, it, the ID for that, the default name is the module, which it comes from GR Digital, and then the name of the block. So I can look up, like, okay, that's what the block is called in, in code. So I can look that up uh, and look into my, uh, uh, look into the manual uh, to see what the documentation says. And there's a lot of stuff in there about how to design the taps. Um, so you can read about how to design the taps, and it is the most important parameter to this block. Uh, it's going to define how it behaves in almost every respect. It's how we define our, uh, our in this case, a root race cosine. It's, it's the match filter is what we're doing. And, and again, that should be just uh, explained in the uh, documentation. Um, continue to read our, the, the documentation. It's going to tell us that we have to oversample the filter caps. And here what I've done is the sample rate. And again, go to the doc, see, okay, well, how do I define that, uh, that root race cosine filter? What does it mean by oversampling? So I still don't know what the heck this is talking about. Um, I've read the documentation, I've looked this stuff up, uh, but what, what the heck is going on? I haven't a clue. One thing that you can do is, I'm not going to bother pulling it up right now, but uh, go to your command line or go to your favorite editor or favorite search tool, like uh, Linux command line and use prep. You're going to do a search. All right? I know this thing is called uh, uh, PFP clock sync. What if I do a search for PFP clock sync within the source code or just go to your examples directory, and you'll see this huge number amount of uh, uh, output, not huge, but a, a sizable amount of output of all the places where the PFP clock sync is, uh, is called inside the code. And a lot of those are in the examples directory. All right, so we provide a lot of examples. That might be a good place to look for how to use the PFP clock sync. So we're going to pull up the, one of our examples. In this case, one of the, the things that Grep taught us was that PAM dot, uh, PAM timing dot GRC. So the, this block does uh, pulse amplitude modulation uh, sample timing recovery. So in this example that we've provided, this block is used. Hopefully it's used correctly. So you can pop that open and say, all right, these are the, this is how the filter was defined for that example. And it, this was one before, and that's the sample rate. That's defining the sample rate of that filter, again, from our documentation. We know that. Now I'm oversampling it by this factor of n filts. Now, maybe I still don't understand what this oversampling is, but I'll just copy and paste this because it seems to work here. Why doesn't it work elsewhere? So valid way of going about this. I mean, obviously, you might want to dig into it and learn more. But, um, uh, but and you can study all of this is, is with the documentation. But here's a good example of how to set that property value up. Um, and so there's a lot of examples in, in the radio. And that's what uh, Chris was talking about with GR samples. Okay? All these blocks are going to have, or we'll, we want to have these uh, exemplars uh, for where to go and look if you don't understand what's going on. So I plug that value into my signal, and this is what comes out now. Instead of having, uh, you know, we had good timing up there, and now we've got the timing signal at the output looks really good, and our constellation looks like UPSK, exactly what we expected. All right, so we've at least debugged to the point where we have a known working signal, and now we can do our detector. So that's an important thing, uh, uh, the part of this uh, stage of the talk. Use your instrumentation, debug up to that point, make sure you have a known working uh, signal before you even uh, 
uh, start the next pages. Now we need to actually create this block. And so we're going to um, look at uh, uh, our, again, go to the wiki page, figure out what we need to do, uh, watch uh, Martin's uh, talk when we post it on YouTube uh, in a month or so about how you actually use GR Modules, how you actually create a block. Um, so I know I need a block, but I don't know what I'm doing. Let's go for some help. We actually have an entire tutorial on the website specifically designed to help people use GR Module and create their own tree modules. Um, there's actually a second one here, how to configure your IO3 block to, to be able to better uh, integration with the radio kind of in, uh, ecosystem. But this one just teaches us how to use GR module. And all we're going to need from this right now is just a new mod and add. So not going to spend a whole lot of time on these slides because we already went through it with Martin. But here, if I, if I have a module, if I'm, I'm working for an organization, we've already started developing a bunch of module, a bunch of blocks to do this stuff, I probably have a module available. But saying I don't, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and create a new module for this purpose. Uh, so we just walk through here. I'm calling this one detectors. And I'm just going to create you know, maybe a series of detectors for different signals. So use a GR module for that purpose. Uh, and now it's good um, to create the, the module space. Now we need to actually add the block. Uh, so this is my first detector, detector zero. Simple name, stupid name, but, uh, but for our purposes here, that's just what it is. Detector. Uh, give us some arguments, do the whole thing, right? We, we, we walked through this, we, we uh, read the tutorial, we looked at Martin's uh, presentation. At least we can get that far. At this point, go through there, like before you do anything else, just go through there and do the basic setup. Like don't even bother doing any of the, you know, do the signal processing. Just make sure that, you know, you've fixed your GR uh, uh, IO signature, the inputs and output spaces, you know, there's going to be these little plus uh, uh, bracket things there. That's going to tell you where you need to fill in a lot of information. Um, you know, basically just fix that up and uh, compile this. So we're not actually doing any signal processing. We're just going to, you know, we've done everything we need to do just to make it work. We want to make sure this thing works. So make your build directory again. Just follow all the steps to make the build directory. Set up your uh, your C make, run make, maybe you run make install, because you just want to compile. Really, literally compile or like compile often. Every time you make a change or something significant, compile because if there's a typo, if there's some, if you screw something up, you'll learn a lot every time you try to compile this uh, this block. So hopefully at this point we have no errors because we've really just made this block and done the bare minimum of the I/O signature uh, to get us to the point where we have more to compile. All right, great. So now we've got at least a, a, a setup that we can work with. Now we actually want to do this detection. So what does the detector look like? All right, we've kind of walked through a little bit of the fact that there's these buffers between blocks um, and what those input items and, uh, and output items in the work function look like. Those are like kind of the core ways of moving uh, data between blocks. So we're going to pull something in from our input uh, data stream. So in our, we're just going to have one input and one output. We're going to pull some data in from our input stream, and we need to do some kind of a signal detection. So really, it's just a correlation. So we have a known word, we're going to cross-correlate uh, our known signal with our input buffer. So we've got to do our you know, multiplies and adds for every, uh, every sample in the known word uh, for as many samples as we have in our input buffer. So if we look at this as our way of doing, uh, as a writing our block or detector, we're going to take this and we're just going to uh, kind of move this along the stream of input samples that we have into our work function. And hopefully, at, at some point, as we want, as every time we re-enter re the work function, uh, we're going we're gonna to call this, we're going to slide this along there, and eventually, hopefully, we detect that, a, that our particular signal has, uh, has occurred. Uh, at the end of this, once we've done our detection here, uh, the output, remember, we're just going to double that imaginary part, again, just to, to avoid this uh, mem copy. We actually want to, let's, let's imagine we're doing some significant signal processing on this input. Uh, so that's all we're going to do. All right, so it's important, the fact that we're not, like, unlike the, the square block that we did, where we're not just, you know, input is being uh, squared uh, into the output, there's actually a, uh, a number of samples that we have to look over at a given time. Um, so we have to kind of keep that in mind when we're dealing, dealing with what I like to call the boundary conditions of writing this block. Because we can't override, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be stuck here. So we don't want to, we want to uh, uh, only sample up to here so that we can get our, uh, so we're always within the boundary of what the work function has taught us, or has told us. 
so that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to show you that code. The code is just ugly. There's, there's really very little to learn from it, except uh, I'm just going to call it do some signal processing. So whatever your you know, signal processing algorithm is, I'm just, I am just created a function. I'm just going to do some signal processing. Uh, stick that in the work function and compile. Again, we're just going to compile to make sure that this, uh, uh, that this happened. And oops, had an error. Okay. And it's tempting. And a lot of people do this at this point. Hey, I compiled my thing and it gave me an error. And this is all they see. They don't see all this other stuff up here. <laughs> Use the compiler. The compiler is a really important tool. And they spend a lot of time telling us what's going on. And luckily the crowd up here is old enough, I think, to... <laughs> All right, so instead of, instead of just having this like focus on, oh, error, let's look at, I mean, it's complicated, right? It, it's not like it's trivial. It's kind of, it can be kind of cryptic. Uh, different compilers will have different level of, uh, of ambiguity here. But what it's going to tell us if we read it enough that my signature for my function, do some signal processing, was wrong. In particular, it's, it's going to tell us that I'm actually trying, uh, it wants uh, two inputs, uh, an integer and a uh, complex, a constant complex array. So I've learned from that. I'm going to do that now. I'm going to plug in my input items. Right? I'm going to look at my input items over this, uh, the length of our, uh, uh, our known work. Run this, recompile. Well, that didn't work either. So again, you're tempted to scream and cry and say, ah, I fixed my error. Why didn't they compile this time? Well, the compiler gave us a little bit more information this time that, and we're going to have to read it maybe a little bit better that we were trying to um, uh, convert. It can't convert argument to from this vector const void star, weird data type that we use in media radio, aka it's just a, a void vector of, uh, of samples. But we wanted a complex vector of floats. All right, well, let's think about that. Remember we had these uh, signatures. I mean, okay, ah, yeah, there we are. This is what our cast was all about. We're casting from this void const star, this const void star, into GR complex samples. That's the thing that we need to use. So pass in instead of input items and hits away. We get to go home because our compil our compilation at this point has computed. So that works. At least it compiled. Didn't do the right thing yet. We haven't gotten there uh, exactly because remember. We don't just want to call this once. The do some signal processing is going to run this algorithm. It's basically this correlation. Do the multiply and add, and do the detector on that output. Then we're going to have to slide over by one. Do that. So we're going to have to iterate over all of the input items that we're given. So I set this block up because I know that by the time I'm at this, uh, this boundary here, I just want to look over those. And I, so I can't slide past that. So let's go ahead and go from the output items minus the length. So we're going to go from there, and we're just going to see all of those samples uh, in our use and signal processing. So that's what our loop is going to do. So that's the next stage that we're going to, we're going to process, try to process and understand. Uh, so we've got our length here, and now we're actually going to index that complex array uh, as we slide through this, uh, this work function that we're told. Um, the Juice and signal processing actually returns uh, an integer in this case, and it re returns a zero uh, for if it never found anything. It returns a one if it did find something. So within that for loop, we can do some. Uh, we can look at the output of uh, do some signal processing. If we see a one, we want to output a tag at that location. So uh, we haven't really talked about tags that much, but tags are these ways of annotating samples in the data stream. Uh, so it's like metadata that we talk, you know, they, like the RX timestamp that the user produces is a tag. So we're going to produce one of those inside of our block. And it has to be at the exact sample, because we want to know that exact sample period uh, where it happens. So that's what the tag stream uh, uh, is for. Um, so we'd like to send a tag, but I, again, I kind of like to go through this stuff a little slowly. I want to get some output from, my, uh, uh, from the work function. You can do this in many ways. You can actually use a proper debugger, um, but honestly, most of us doing signal processing work in video radio, print statements are easy and effective. Um, I know some people cringe at the idea of debugging with print statements. It really has worked well for us. <coughs> We've also introduced this thing called the, the video radio logger. Maybe not for like really development debugging, uh, more for you know something goes wrong in production and you want to send them an error message or a warning. But there's a lot of information on how to use the debugger, so you know we'll use it. 
So, uh, as I said, this guy is going to return a value of 0 or 1. If it's a 1, let's, uh, let's just output to the, the logger and say, hey, we got a, we got a hit. Um, so we detect a sample, and we're telling ourselves which sample in the data stream we're detecting. Uh, so that, this is just uh, using this boost format call to, uh, uh, to output the value i as we're iterating over our loop of samples. Um, so if we ran this, every now and then we should see uh, that logging message being printed to the screen. So that's good. We've, we've at least gotten that far. And here, here's our, uh, our output from the debugger. Uh, at certain samples in the data stream, we detected a, uh, uh, one of our events. From here, um, we actually need to make the tag. From here, we actually need to make the tag. Uh, and so again, we're going to go look at the whole page uh, describing the tag string. Again, there are plenty of examples that use uh, init data tags. Uh, so it's worthwhile going to look at those examples, figure out what's going on here. Easiest thing to do in this case is create a, we actually have a GR tag data type. So we're going to create one of these tag data types, fill it with our information. The information of a tag tells us where in the data stream the tag uh, occurred. So we sample, we, we captured it at this value i, right? So we're just going to stick that offset in there as uh, here at that, that uh, sample i, well, we had our uh, detection uh, statistic here. Give it a key value pair that's going to define what that is. So in this case, uh, the key is going to say detected. So that's we know downstream if we're looking for a detected statistic, we're going to be looking for that particular key name. Uh, the value here doesn't really matter. We're just seeing if it's detected or not. So I just plugged in a, uh, this polymorphic data type. Don't worry about that right now. This is just a value of true. It's just a, a tag with a key of detected, a value of true. Uh, this is just telling us uh, there's an alias that's the block itself. Uh, again, details, we can look that up later. The important thing is, so we've created our tag here, and now we're going to add it to our data stream. Again, we can look up what that uh, prototype is, uh, output zero, and give it the tag. So output zero, we, we emit a tag whenever we see this. Great. We can detect our tag, uh, see what happens. Final thing we're going to do from a single processing perspective is this multiply the imaginary part by two, which is the imaginary part. So again, here's, here's what we had in the last slide from uh, this value, do some single processing down to the output. What we're doing here is just, you can see here, we're, we're splitting up the input into a real and imaginary part, doubling the imaginary part, and putting that into the output buffer. Really, really simple single processing uh, concept in this case. That should work. So let's plug that into that flow graph that we had before. Okay, we created the block, it compiled, we got through that, uh, that stage. Uh, learn all the stuff we needed to get it to compile, created the XML file, uh, and stuck in the detector uh, into the data stream. So out of the clock scene, so we have a synchronized constellation. We now get to, uh, to do our, uh, our detection on the, the output samples. So we're going to detect that, and this is now set up to only trigger when it sees that detected tag. Now this could be replaced, or would eventually be replaced by uh, you know, an actual follow-on process concept that's going to use this, that's finally you know, going, to, going to do something with that information. But right now, we just want to plot the constellation uh, to make sure that we've got our detector concept working. And that's what came out. And we had the input constellation. So let's begin back here. So we're looking at the constellation of the input and the constellation of the output of that detector. And it's not, it's not showing us the right thing. So OK, what's going on here? Um, this is, this is where it starts to get really tricky. Uh, all we know is that there's something going wrong, wrong in our detector. Um, and we're looking down here, the detector on, uh, on sample 267, 267, and then on 77, that's weird, right? Why am I detecting a sample in the data stream uh, at 267, which should come after sample 77? So that's where uh, we look at trying to figure out what is going on in the radio scheduler? What is the sample concept telling me? It doesn't make any sense to, uh, to have this concept of this happening before or after, uh, after that. Um, ah, yeah. So we can also use a tag debugger block. And actually, in this case, that didn't tell us anything. Uh, I didn't I want the output here. That didn't actually tell us anything. So that's a good indication. Okay, no tags are being emitted, no signals being emitted. Uh, so really, nothing is happening with this, uh, this detector block. Um, 
So let's go back and reread the stream tags page, right? We learned a little bit about the stream tags. We know how to, how to create them. We know how to add them to the data stream. Um, but it actually talks about this thing called absolute offset, not the current offset. And this is, this is a hard concept. This is a, there's, there's papers out there. I, there's, a, there's a new book chapter that I, uh, that I published to, to describe this stuff. There is plenty of information out there, uh, but I will admit that this is probably not well represented in the, uh, in the manual so much about the concept between the absolute and the, the current, or what I like to call relative offset. So we're looking at this input buffer here, and that's a circular buffer that's just passing data over and over again. And we're only getting a, a relative look. We're only getting a slice of that data at a time. But it's, we've seen maybe millions, maybe billions of samples coming through this block before them. A tag is associated with the absolute time. Because within this block, this relative time, and there's all these other blocks running in our flow graph. They're all on different threads. They're all seeing uh, data coming in at, at different, uh, different amounts of data uh, throughout. The only way to really synchronize a tag and it to its exact sample in the entire history of the running flow graph is with this absolute offset. Again, I've read this page, and I've learned that I can use this n items written. This is how many items I've ever written to my output buffer, from zero to you know however many trillions of, tr trillions of samples I might have seen. So now my offset, my relative offset of i, is offset by this n items written. So if I've gone through the process, and this is now, to me, I think a really fair and, and important question that you might go to the mailing list to ask us. Why didn't my eye work? What's going on with these stream tags? I don't understand this uh, absolute offset. Come to us on IRC or on the mailing list, and you know, we'll, we'll help you out there uh, by telling you, yes, you've got to know the absolute number, and this is how you get that information. So that's the resource that we would use at this stage of uh, trying to understand what our block is doing wrong. So we fixed that, and uh, and it's the, uh, let's see. Yes, so we fixed that, but the other thing, yeah, I should have showed this up as well. Let's go back here and pretend like we've, so we've at least fixed the, the absolute tag offset. Um, what I've done, if you remember, I've done that stream watch block from the beginning, so I know my setup is every so many number of, of samples, I'm going to have this new word. But if we actually look at the output after having solved this uh, offset problem, you would have actually seen that, that uh, those tags are being emitted at non-constant um, uh, non uh, differences between each other. Like sometimes it'll take 100,000 samples, another time it might take 50,000 samples or 65,000 samples, you know, it's just, it, it's wrong. It feels wrong, it's doing the wrong thing. You know, it should be lockstep. Every, you know, every so many thousands of samples, we should get a detection, uh, or our detector is behaving badly. So this might clue us in. Again, we have to kind of understand what a generated block does and how it interacts with the scheduler. We have input items and we have an, we have an input items buffer and an output items buffer. And that input item buffer, we're consuming from that, and we're going to return, we're going to produce onto the output buffer. And if you read up on it, this return statement says, this is how many output items I have uh, produced. The type of block that we're running is a GR sync block, so this is also the number of items that I've consumed. Except that I was only looking over from an output from zero to, to the edge there, right? So what happens, uh, yeah. so what happened when I got to here? The next time I enter this work function, these, all these samples are gone. So I'm at this page, uh, this, this sample, the next time I enter the work function. So I've actually forgotten to look over those samples. So that's a mistake. If you kind of follow through again, that's the boundary condition problem of a new radio work function, is to understand what happens when you, at the beginning, and when you hit the edge of that, uh, uh, the buffer. So now I want to be able to try to look beyond. If I could just, you know, if I could go through all of those samples from zero and slide this over until this, this uh, and output items minus one is the last thing that I'm able to look over. Well, what about those samples there? Those don't exist, right? I've, I've explained my uh, my buffer, or my work function has told me I have this many items, but I want to be able to look over there now. 
I could do something where maybe I could stash those values for the next time. I could do some mem copies in, uh, into the work function and keep some state between those. But mem copies are pretty ugly. We try to avoid them as much as possible. Um, but there's a trick here. Uh, so we want to scale the length uh, of the uh, symbols. Uh, and I want to use this thing called set history. And here's again this thing where you go, great, set history, thanks Tom. Great. You're the expert, you know what you're talking about. How the heck was I supposed to know that? Um, and again, I really, I, I have to say, I don't think we've really represented the schedule really well. I, I point this out, this is kind of my go-to, it's a slide deck that I produced that really kind of goes through the entire uh, Radio scheduler. This goes into this history concept quite, uh, uh, quite a lot because it's a very commonly used thing. So you might also think, well, where else could I find a situation like this where I might be reading beyond my buffer? Well, I'm doing a correlation, which is very similar to a per filter. So the per filter would also be a place where you can look as for an example of what you might want to do in handling that boundary condition. So here we are, we've uh, looked over the entire length, but we are given this ability, this, uh, this ability to know that those samples are actually full. That's what this set history uh, concept is doing. It's giving us that information over there. So we plug that into it, and finally we have the ability to, uh, to do our detection successfully. So this is what the final block would actually look like. I've done this in the constructor. I've set my history in the constructor. I've stored my link. Here's my input and output signature. Here's that doubling of the imaginary part, doing my signal processing, detecting that we've, uh, uh, we've gotten the, the right result, and we, we posted a tag. And we've now posted a tag at the right number of uh, uh, items written uh, plus this offset. So now if I actually run this, and my detection should happen now. So I've detected a cat in my, uh, my internet of cats. That was my detection statistic to, uh, to discover this constellation that I put into our, uh, I snuck into our QPS case signal. So after all that work, we're able to do whatever kind of statistical uh, uh, analysis on that signal. And you can see here, hey, look, I've actually detected a, uh, a proposition. I've actually repeated it four times, so you actually get multiple uh, detections for there. So that's my, that's my output. I've walked through this, I've, I've used the, the, uh, the Gary website, I've used the mailing list, I've used the, uh, the manual, and I've used tools of the operating system. You know, we don't try to divorce ourselves completely from the fact that we're running on a computer that does a whole lot of other things for us. Lots of great tools that we use in video radio. Grep, great, Git Grep is great as well. So if you're in a Git uh, project, you can use Git Grep and it will uh, it does a really nice search within the source tree that's checked into Git. Git itself is a fantastic tool. Right? Every time you do something, commit it, make a backup. You know, so it basically makes a backup. You can always recover your history if you store it in Git already. CMake, that's our uh, build tool. Um, knowing how that works, uh, again, using, using their um, online tools, manual. Stack Overflow is actually a fantastic resource for stuff like this. Uh, and then, as I said, you know, so grab, uh, but all these shell commands, you get, get to know your system a little bit um, because we're not going to provide this entire closed environment uh, to do your development work in. These things really help you. Your IDE, right? I use Eclipse. Uh, other people use Vim or, uh, sorry, I use Emacs. Uh, but other people use Eclipse or Vim or C Line. You know, those things will also help. They give you a lot of information uh, to do. So, again, lots and lots of places to look for help. Uh, and understanding where to use them and how to use them uh, kind of fits, uh, fits the model of what's the right development model for you. Um, I want to, to end on the challenge problem. Okay, we've gone through a, a kind of a fake block to detect our cat constellation. Uh, but now let's actually look at one of the more complex blocks. This polyphase clock sync. I use it all the time to do my PAM timing uh, symbol recovery. But, uh, but it's pretty complicated. Uh, it does almost everything you can imagine doing inside of the scheduler. Setting the history, it, uh, um, does it set history? Maybe I should have said history. But it's a block, so it's not a sync block, so it does its own consume. It does this weird enable update rate, you gotta look at what that means. Uh, it actually has to adjust its own relative rate. It does, you know, it, it overloads these functions, check topology and forecast. Everything that you can do to manipulate this block within the scheduler 
this block does. So if you want to look at a complex one and then burn your house down to try to understand it, this is probably like one of the more complex ones that we actually have uh, in our uh, uh, in the projects. So I tried to make that at least a little bit fun. Um, you know, there's plenty of details uh, for what to do, what to what to experiment with, what what can go wrong in a block. Um, I could have spent hours up here actually like hand coding this for you. You could have watched what you know we fail repeatedly to try to make that block, but uh, we want to put this into half an hour. But I hope that at least gives you some clue as to development models and mindsets uh, going, and a few little hints into what happens with PD radio. Uh, and its work functions. Uh, I'm probably well over time in a little bit. Um, so thank you. Are there any questions? Maybe one or two quick ones? Good. Can, I, can anybody somebody else be a runner for me? Thank you. Um, now you will ask describe the day of my life here in terms of debugging. Uh, one question which I have is, um, if I use the standard out for, for printing things out, uh, I often get the terminal overwhelmed and you know, yeah, I get the gray screen. Is there a way to somehow stop the flow a little bit and let it breathe? Yeah, stopping, so the, you know, the question about uh, overflow of the output stream, and especially because this is a multi-threaded environment in your radio with a thread per block. So if, you have, if you're writing to standard out in multiple different blocks that may be operating at the same time, you could get you know, uh, print statements in the wrong order, or print statements on top of print statements, you know, that becomes ugly. The GR logger is actually designed for multi-threading in mind, so the GR logger will help with that. You can also have the GR logger dump, instead of going to standard out, you can actually direct it to a file, so you can build the file afterwards. There's no real way to just like, there's no, you could, you could instrument this, but really kind of out of the box, general being radio stuff, there's no way to run the flow graph for a while and then just arbitrarily stop it like a debug, like, you know, like an old debug kind of process would go. You could instrument something like that. We could go into like, a lot of details about what that means. But it's not really, that's not like the model that we have out of the box. Uh, it's, weird, you know, it's kind of runtime, constantly running production type uh, environment. Um, so that's a wishy washy answer I know. But there are tools to kind of help us uh, I think the logger, like I said, by making sure it's out in the right uh, order and the ability to go to the file is, is one of the things that you can look at. Um, and then like those, what Tim was talking about with the time plots. Uh, where you can like trigger off an event or trigger off a tag, that that will not stop the flow graph, but it would stop the drawing of the of the graph, and then you can look at that from a more dynamic standpoint. So little things like that. Yep. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up then. Get on to uh, to our next presenter, which is Bob McGuire. So thank you.